All right, module number four, uh, implementing centralized wireless access, uh, which is essentially what we're talking about this whole class, right? Um, centralized mode means that we have a uh, wireless LAN controller. Centralized access provides tunneling of the user traffic to the controller. So we have a system-wide coordination for channel management, power management, rogue AP detection, security, everything. Right? That's, that's essentially what we're talking about. So our focus in this module is uh, centralized management with a wireless LAN controller. Now you can also use prime infrastructure and other tools to provide management, but we're going to describe the different management options that, and control interfaces that you're going to see on the wireless controller. We'll, talk, uh, we'll do a deep dive into how we initialize our access points. We'll take a look at some of the additional wireless LAN control, uh, controller features. There is uh, implementing IPv6 as well, which really isn't that different than IPv4. Uh, just the IP addressing is different, and there's a, a couple of caveats to how we communicate in the IPv6 environment. We'll take a look at how we configure client access. Uh, and then in this module, we'll also take a look at roaming uh, in this AeroS architecture. Remember, AeroS is the... Uh, the centralized wireless LAN approach. Um, so that's what we're going to do in this module. Um, we've got you know four or five or six different lessons here that we're going to be going through. In lesson number one, initializing the wireless LAN controller, uh, which is what you guys are going to be doing in the next lab exercise. In a small campus environment, the centralized deployment is going to provide all of that ease of configuration and ease of management. You can use iOS XE or you can use an AeroS platform. With both options, after the network infrastructure has been completed, the controller has to be obviously set up, initialized, and so on. I wouldn't say obviously. I mean, you guys may not have done that before. Um, so you have to access the controller through the command line uh, initially to kind of set up all of the basic settings. There are several options for management that includes that command line interface, once it is configured, a GUI interface, um, and um, each one of them have their own specific function and their own specific access requirements. Uh, the wireless controller also has lots of different interface ports. Those are gonna have to be configured for management, for network access, uh, and so on. So what we're gonna talk about in this first lesson is essentially that process, right? How do I, I, I just got a controller, what do I do, right? Uh, I don't I have any idea. I mean, do I connect to the console? Is there a default IP address that I can go to in the GUI? And so on. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So the deployment options for the controller itself, we'll talk about the CLI initialization, describe the controller uh, CLI setup wizard, uh, describe that, um, that CLI initialization, like I said. Um, we'll take a look at the menu elements. We'll take a look at the differences between the different ports, the different interfaces, what kind of mappings we can perform between those ports and interfaces. We'll take a look at um, the centralized controller deployment. And then in the last part of this, even though we're not going to use this in the, in the lab environment, We'll take a, look, a quick look at how we can use prime infrastructure to manage the controller as well. All right. Uh, very, very good chapter because it does give you an idea of what you need to do to be able to initialize these, these um, controllers. If you recall, we talked about this, the centralized deployment model used with the AeroS platforms like a 5508, like a 2504, right? This, this platform here is an AeroS platform. We're running um, version 8, I believe, uh, that advanced. Uh, yeah, 80115. This is an AeroS image. So this is uh, uh, running that centralized model, right? Uh, this particular access point. I mean, uh, controller, excuse me. Uh, so the mobility components, we talked about a mobility agent, we talked about what a mobility controller was. Um, those are both on this particular wireless LAN controller. We're not dispersing those functions to other parts of the network. Even though it's not shown on this diagram, um, we can actually deploy these wireless LAN controllers in a high availability mode uh, 
with active and standby controllers. And uh, in the next lesson, we'll talk about how we can add that functionality into that environment. If you recall from our previous discussion, the mobility agent is what terminates the CAPWAP tunnels, maintains the client database, and provides for policy enforcement. They actually don't have the mobility agent defined on this particular diagram. The mobility controller is used for client mobility, moving from access point to access point, radio resource management, spectrum management, and intrusion detection pieces. Um, and the focus of our lesson here is going to be using the ROS component, and uh, which is good because that's really what Cisco has decided to focus their attention on in the deployment of these uh, controllers. If I do decide to use the iOS XE switch in a centralized model, we can do that with like uh, a 5760. The mobility component still exists, mobility agent, mobility controller, also installed on the uh, wireless LAN controller, provides the same exact functionality. CapWap termination, client database, policy enforcement on the agent, client mobility, radio resource management, spectrum management on the controller itself. The wireless LAN controller out of the box doesn't have a default configuration. So when you pull a controller out of the box, you have to run the initial setup wizard. This initial wireless uh, controller configuration is done through the console port um, using the CLI. That's typically how we do it. I mean, you can use the web interface, but uh, you would have to you know, set up a host to be in the default uh, IP space. Um, but the console port is a, is a little bit easier. All models of the controller uh, have an RJ45 uh, interface for that serial connection assuming it's a standard physical appliance, right? Virtual controllers obviously are not going to have that. Before I can configure the controller for basic operation, connect the PC using a virtual terminal application. The CLI is then accessed from the console port. Um, and uh, once the network or once the device is configured, once I've gone in and set up my IP address properties and I have reachability, I can then tell NET or SSH to the controller to manage the controller from that point forward. All right. Now the CLI can be used for normal configuration changes, but it's a little bit cumbersome. So typically what we will do is once we've got that initial configuration done, we'll go into the web GUI and we'll set up the rest of the configuration in the GUI. Uh, there are some pretty um, nice troubleshooting and debug uh, options that you have in the command line that you would not have in the GUI. So for advanced troubleshooting and advanced debugging, CLI commands uh, will usually be preferred, right? In fact, Cisco TAC, if you ever have an issue with your wireless controller, Cisco TAC will generally direct you to the CLI. The APs have a similar CLI. Uh, they have a console and Telnet and SSH. Uh, but the APs are a lot more limited, uh, especially if they're managed and controlled by the controller. Once the controller's been initially set up, the CLI interfaces can be changed um, and, and, and modified. So you're not locked into the configuration uh, uh, that, that you do through that initial wizard. All right. The GUI method, that's typically what we're going to use uh, when we, when we want to set up the controller for the, uh, after, after we've gone through the initial um, setup wizard. So one method of setting up the controller is through the CLI. After connecting your PC, you powered up the controller, you're going to be prompted through a series of questions and uh, be asked uh, different questions um, uh, and different configuration parameters. You guys are going to see this in the uh, in the lab uh, but let me mention a few of the things that you'll see all right this is called the auto install process uh, and you're gonna be asked things like what's the system name what kind of passwords do you want are you going to use uh, I static IP or DHCP are we can are you going to configure uh, link aggregation what's the VLAN for the management interface uh, 
that's going to have to match your switch configuration, of course. Uh, the IP address of the DHCP server that's going to give the IP addresses to the clients, the management interface of the controller, the service port interface. We'll talk about the different interface types that exist on the controller uh, as well a little bit later on. Virtual interface IP, mobility group. I mean, there's all kinds of things, right? You guys are going to see these, uh, these different things when you go into the, the configuration. There is one thing I want to point out here, though. You know, because not all of these things have to be set up. Not all these things are mandatory. You can go into the GUI and set those things up afterwards. But make sure that when you're going through the initial uh, configuration wizard, the auto install process, that you specify the correct country code. Um, because if you don't specify the correct country code, the access points will not be able to join the controller. The country code on the controller has to match the country code for the APs. And that's, by the way, set physically on those APs. Uh, you can enable or disable radios. You can uh, set up radio resource management. I will essentially go through the most basic configuration when I'm, when I'm setting up the command line. Um, and, and then I'll go into the GUI and, and set up other aspects like uh, mobility name and, and uh, wireless LAN SSID information and so on. Um, there are several different mandatory configurations that you would definitely have to apply though, okay? Um, so that is the, the, the CLI. Now, you have a, a GUI option as well, of course. Once you've put in the URL of the device, then you can be, you'll be prompted to go through the uh, GUI wizard. There is a default IP address for the, the controller, um, and uh, your client would just have to be in that subnet. I can't recall what that that actual address is, but um, but typically we're going to use the CLI to do the initial configuration. It's going to walk you through the same stuff, right? System name, password, service interface, management interface, and so on. Another option you have is to use what we call wireless LAN express setup. Uh, in fact, when you're setting up um, some access points initially, this is something that you're required to do, right? The benefit of using the wireless LAN express setup is that you get the GUI access, right? Extends beyond that, by the way. Um, so you can change some of the default behavior. Uh, the other benefit of the West feature is that there's a dashboard uh, on the controller to give you the status uh, after your initial configuration. It's still gonna give you access to all the traditional GUI interfaces, but um, that dashboard here I'll show you so this is the traditional interface that you see here right but if I was to go to oops if I was to go back to home what the heck that's weird All right. if I was to go back to home here this is that wireless express setup uh, dashboard that we had talked about right um, so this, my, my, uh, my um, wireless controller set up to, to see this initially. Click on the advanced tab or advanced button and then you can go to the traditional uh, screen here for the configuration. There are two options when it comes to WES, uh, this, this wires, wireless LAN express setup. You can use a wired setup or you can do a wireless setup. Obviously, the left is the wired setup, the right is the wireless setup. Uh, in the wired setup, the controller must have its default factory configuration, meaning there's no configuration that you've applied. You then connect your laptop to any port. The ports are enabled to provide DHCP, which provides an IP address in the 192.168.1.0 subnet. And, uh, um, so there's no crossover cable needed, the ports are auto-sensing with auto MDIX and so on. Once you receive an IP address, you can use uh, the uh, IP address of 192.168.1.1 to get to that initial GUI configuration page. All right. With a wireless setup, connect any AP to any port. Uh, port 3 and 4, I think, yeah, 3 and 4 on this particular controller, 2504, has a POE. The AP will be configured to use the BG radios, 
uh, and it's going to start broadcasting an SSID of clean air, um, Cisco air provision. Uh, and then you just simply connect to that. You'll be assigned an IP address. Um, the, uh, there is WPA2 established on that. Uh, and you can see the password is password. Uh, and then you'll get an IP address in the 1.x range, and then you browse to 192.168.1.1 and go through the GUI configuration. All right? Uh, that's an example using the 2504, but it's a similar process for some of the other controllers as well, uh, the 5508 and so on. All right? Once you get into the GUI, uh, type in the IP address. Let's assume that we're going through this West process, 192.168.1.1. That's going to launch the Wireless LAN Express Setup Wizard. Uh, and we see some of the pages here. Um, but uh, the first page is just the admin information. The second page is the general controller information. And then the last page is the SSID information. All right? Uh, it verifies all the fields and so on. All right, now with regard to the wireless LAN controller setup screen, it's kind of hard to read here. The graph, the images are not very clear, but uh, it's going to ask you for basic controller information, uh, system name, country, time, uh, and you know, basic parameters, uh, anything that you would probably already know. In the SSID setup screen, you can set up two SSIDs, uh, employee and guest. But you have to set up at least one, which would be typically your, your corporate SSID. That's the same for the command line as well, by the way. When you're going through the command line wizard, the auto install feature, you have to set up at least one SSID. All right. The employee network requires the SSID network name, all the security parameters, the VLAN that can belong to, and so on. The security is set up by default to use WPA2 personal. Um, that's generally going to be in most cases, well, I wouldn't say in most cases, a lot of cases WPA2 personal is what, what you're going to use for your, your wireless LANs, but WPA2 enterprise could be used as well, but it defaults to WPA2 personal. All right. After the, this, the controller is going to reboot. It's going to save all the settings. You can create a guest network there, by the way, as well. Uh, there's a little check box, if I recall. Uh, to add that. That'll also be WPA2 personal. And then you'll finally get a summary page. So once you have the SSIDs created, the last page is going to summarize all the data uh, and then you can uh, complete that configuration. Okay. Connect the wireless LAN controller to your switch. All right. Uh, by the way, on the 2504, port 1 typically is going to be used as a trunk port to connect to the switch. All right. The West changes uh, some parameters. Uh, because it is a wizard, we want to be able to identify some parameters uh, based on best practice standards. Uh, session timeouts get changed. Um, there's a few things. I, I can't recall all the different things. Oh, well, it kind of lists them here, right? Um, so you can see what, what um, kinds of things are enabled by default as a, as a best practice standard. All right. Then you can go to the launch page. I already showed you guys that launch page, uh, which is just the IP address of the controller. Uh, even it, you can connect to it via HTTP or HTTPS, but it will convert to um, HTTPS and HTTPS is enabled by default. Uh, there's a timeout. Uh, of about 30 minutes, I believe, on this particular screen here, unless you use West and changes it to a different, uh, different timeout period. So once you uh, log in, the first thing you're going to see is this uh, dashboard called the landing page, right? So you can see the wireless networks, how many access points, active client devices, rogue APs, interfering <laughs> devices by the radio. In fact, let me pull that up real quick. Um, it's interesting. I want to show you something real quick. So I can see that I can see six rogue APs, and I can see what those, what those APs look like. Uh, and then I can actually drill down into these APs and get some additional information. Uh, now, I can actually come in here and hit contain. Um, not generally recommended, 
uh, because essentially what happens at this point is I just keep sending a bunch of DOF messages to the um, spoofing the IP the access point so it just keeps disconnecting all the clients it doesn't actually jam the radio frequency spectrum but uh, um, so I can I can contain that AP uh, I wouldn't be very polite for my neighbors but uh, yeah um, <coughs> so there are a lot of different things that you can see from here um, Clicking on the elements like I just uh, showed you takes you directly to that screen for those particular elements, right? Um, the bottom part of the screen uh, displays things like top access points, top applications, top operating systems, and top clients. Let me go back to that screen here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and enable one of these features here, top applications. And remember where to go to do that. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna have to figure out where where this is placed. Yeah, I'll look at that. I'll show you guys that later. I can't remember where they put this on the screen here, but I don't want to waste too much time going through that. I don't have it enabled in my environment here because, um, uh, I, you know, obviously it's just my home access point. I'm really not too concerned about seeing that information. In fact, I don't even really log into this access point or this controller that much. All right. Um, so as you can see by default, those the top applications, top app operating systems, and so on is not enabled by default. But you can see what it would look like here. Um, you know, identify what what those uh, what those are. Kind of useful, I guess. Using it uses NBAR and other things to recognize the applications, um, but it's kind of useful. All right. Um, obviously, if you click on the Advanced tab, uh, then you can. Um, see all of the other configurations. The advanced button here takes you to kind of the standard. This used to be the, the primary landing page. You can change that, by the way. Uh, under the settings, you can change which page is the, uh, is the default landing page. Um, I don't change it. It's pretty easy to go ahead and just click the advanced tab. Once you get into the advanced menu, all kinds of options here, right? You've got the monitor option, which gives you a view of wireless LAN controller, the APs, the rogues, the statistics. That's that's that kind of that main screen. You've got uh, wireless LANs, which allows you to set up all of your SSIDs, your security policies, your AP groups. The controller, this is where you're going to set up all of the controller functionality. Uh, let me jump in here real quick, show you some of the things that you'll see. Uh, and we'll be talking about these, these pieces throughout the course, right, throughout the rest of today and tomorrow, but all the different components that would apply to the controller as a whole. Um, this is the general configuration. You can do inventory to see, you know, the specifics about your controller. This is the part number for this particular controller, CT2504-K9. I'm very curious to see what those are running for these days. I imagine that they're, you can get them for pretty cheap these days. So you can see all kinds of other information here, interfaces, interface groups. Uh, and we're going to talk about all of these different components, right? That's the whole point. How do I set up my controller? Uh, a lot of this stuff gets configured in that initial configuration but how do I set up my controller for these functions? Um, yeah, a couple hundred bucks, that's not bad. I mean, obviously there's some that are more expensive and some that are less expensive. Um, and yeah, they're pretty, still pretty pricey. You'd have to kind of sift through and see if you could find one. Um, but they're good, uh, good little boxes. Um, worth the investment if you're gonna be doing a lot of wireless configuration. Um, definitely should be able to find uh, some a little bit cheaper. This one here is it's a pretty good good price. 
probably get it for about 350 if you want. Uh, this one's not it, buy it now. So anyway, uh, highly recommend it if you want to if you want to be able to continue to play around with things and and configure things. Uh, you can also do the virtual controller, by the way. Um, I believe you can set that up with a demo license for free, um, but it does require setting up a VMware environment. So the menu bar across the top uh, is just your main navigation source to go to all the different configuration options. The monitor menu, like I said, is a summary of the controller. Uh, the controller menu, all the general configurations, and then the wireless menu, that's where you're going to configure and modify your AP settings, your radio settings. Don't confuse wireless with wireless LANs, right? Wireless LANs are all your SSIDs and all the properties of your SSIDs. Wireless is the physical devices and the radios and the access points and so on. All right, now there are some advanced uh, configuration options. The security menu, that's where you're going to configure things like AAA, you're going to upload certificates, you're going to set up ACLs, web auth uh, configuration, uh, the management menu, uh, SNMP, GUI, command line, telnet, SSH type of settings. Uh, this is where you're also going to be able to set up lobby admin access, local management user access. You also set up log files here. Um, software activation is done here as well. Uh, command menu um, is where you can actually upload and download files to the device. So you can grab the configuration. You can upload configurations. You can upload new software. Uh, you can also reboot the controller from there, uh, or you can uh, refresh it to a factory default. And then the feedback, which, yeah, feedback, okay? All right, now some items in the controller itself, um, uh, whether it's the controller configuration or the monitoring screens, have additional command options that are available. Uh, and you can see that from the little drop down there. Uh, it is kind of annoying sometimes how it works, but uh, let me show you that real quick. Let me go back to my web page. All right. So you may be going through and doing specific configurations. Let's say I'm in wireless LANs and I jump into my SSID uh, right here. Well, if you look at the right side here, you'll have these little tabs and you can do additional configuration, little drop down arrow, but it's, uh, I believe it's Java based. So I've run into situations with specific browsers where this doesn't pop up and it's kind of annoying. You can see it's already kind of well, it's just wrapping around there. But you'll see that that um, in lots and lots of different locations, right? Um, so always kind of look to the right. We don't see it there, but I'll bet if I click on my radio here, uh, I should see something. Right, so you have additional options here, configure detail. Um, so I can go into these uh, these different sub-menus, I guess, you if you will. All right, so uh, make sure you look for those when you're doing your your specific configurations or verifying your configurations. All right. Now, one of the things that we definitely want to talk about, which is very important, is uh, what type of interfaces do I have on my wireless controller? Depending on the controller type will depend on what types of interfaces you have. But when I was uh, working with this technology originally, the, you know, when I started doing wireless and, and specifically working with these controllers, this was a very confusing aspect to me. Uh, understanding the difference between a port and an interface and a wireless LAN. All right, so we're going to define, I want to define for you guys some of this terminology. A port, obviously, uh, as the diagram indicates, is a physical interface to the network. Okay. Um, so when you see references in documentation, configuration documentation, whatever it might be, and they're referencing a port, they mean the physical interface. Interface does not mean a physical interface. Interface is a logical network interface. All right. And actually there are several different types of logical network interfaces that exist. So, uh, uh one of them can be dynamic. So that's going to include VLAN tags, uh, and that's going to get associated to a port. Some interfaces are static, uh, and, and they actually have to exist on the system in order for the system to function properly. Uh, 
and then you also have a management interface. Um, the management interface is actually an example of a static interface. So we'll get into more detail about those interfaces in a little bit. If I come into my controller here and I go under controller and I go into interfaces, you can see that I have essentially, um, well, there's a, uh, a management interface, which is the uh, interface that I use to actually access the controller. And then there's this thing called a virtual interface, which is used by the um, access point. So we'll talk about that these dynamic interfaces and so on. Uh, it it uh, does get a little bit confusing, but I'll make sure that that confusion is erased by going through it with you guys. And then the wireless LAN. The wireless LAN, that's probably the easiest one to understand. Uh, that is your SSIDs um, and uh, all of the associated information for the wireless networks, all right? Wireless LANs get associated to an interface. So that determines how the VLAN tag on the wired side of the network is applied. So let's say, for example, I go into my wireless LAN. Uh, this is my uh, wire. I only have one wireless LAN in my network here. I go into my wireless LAN and I click on the uh, details uh, and you can see that it is uh, tied to an interface. Now, normally you wouldn't tie it to the management interface. You would actually create another interface uh, I'm running a small network here, right? I'm not doing tagging. I don't have uh, uh, specific VLAN set up. So I'm not concerned about that. But um, you would see a list of all the interfaces that would be dropped down. Now, if I go into my interfaces, one of the things, and this is how the, the SSID gets tied to a VLAN, when you go into the interface, you can actually see what VLAN that interface belongs to. I'm using the default VLAN for this interface, but if I was to create a new uh, interface, I could actually specify the VLAN here. So maybe for my corporate network, it's in VLAN 10. I would create a corporate interface. I would apply all the appropriate settings to that corporate interface. What physical port is it tied to? Again, the physical port could be a trunk, so you can have multiple interfaces tied to a port. To the same port. An interface is virtual, a port is physical. So uh, this would specify the VLAN tag and then I would establish the uh, appropriate IP address information for that particular interface. Hold on one second. Sorry I had to sneeze there. Okay so uh, just keep in mind, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but an interface is virtual. Uh, interfaces do typically get tied to SSIDs. Uh, and I've decided in my particular case, because it's a small network, I'm just going to use my management interface as, my, as the uh, AP interface as well, so that my um, SSIDs will run over this interface. So you would go into the controller, you'd set up the interfaces, um, there's really nothing to do with the ports here. I mean, if I go into ports, I can see the physical ports that exist and speed and duplex and so on. Um, but uh, notice I'm not really specifying whether it's a tagged port or it's an untagged port. Um, it's done by default, right? Uh, it's all negotiated by default. The uh, assigning the VLAN ID to the virtual interface is what's going to identify whether that traffic is tagged or not. Okay, so when you go into interface and you create create an interface, uh, that's where you're going to specify the VLAN tag. And and uh, zero means just don't tag it, right? So uh, if I put a 20 in here, then obviously that traffic would be tagged into VLAN 20. All right. Uh, obviously, there are many many other properties that you can configure here. I don't want to jump the gun. We're going to be discussing some of that stuff as we move through the rest of the lessons. All right. All right. Now let's talk about the physical ports. That's pretty easy to understand. A port provides physical connectivity to the network uh, so that you can gain access to the infrastructure, right? 5500 series wireless LAN controller has eight ports. They're one gig each. 2504 has four ports, one gig each. The WISM. Um, is 
not doesn't have any physical ports, but it does have a backplane connection, uh, up to 20 gigabits of, of connectivity through the backplane. The 7500 series, uh, eight ports, I believe. Yeah, eight ports, 10 gig, as well as the 8510. And you can go on cisco.com and see some of the other details there. Each distribution system port by default is a trunk, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to tag the traffic. You can use the native VLAN if you don't want to do any tagging. All right, but you can't, as I showed you in the port configuration, you can't specify the characteristics of that port configuration from a trunk perspective. So you do need to configure the switch side as a trunk, even if you're only using one SSID and you're not tagging any of the traffic, okay? When you have a link aggregation configured, it does change the behavior of the ports a little bit, but when it's disabled, which is the, the configuration by default, each interface is mapped to at least one port, okay? The interfaces are virtual, right? Like my management interface. Uh, you can also map things like a management interface or a dynamic interface to an optional secondary port if you want, as a backup. So if for some reason the primary port fails, the interface automatically moves to the backup port. We would typically do that in an enterprise environment. If we had a switch stack, we would put one management interface on one switch in the stack and another interface on another switch in the stack, or we might even use uh, VSS or other ways of providing that resiliency and that redundancy. Okay. Also, as I mentioned before, multiple interfaces can be mapped to a single port. Makes sense, right? I mean, you could have 20 or 30 SSIDs. Obviously, you don't have 20 or 30 physical ports. All right, so the ports are easy to understand. Let's get into the interfaces a little bit. All right, interfaces basically fall into two different categories. A static interface and a dynamic interface. A static interface is a system interface that cannot be removed, uh, and it serves a very specific purpose. Uh, depending on the type of device, there can be up to three static interfaces. Management, service, uh, which by the way is on the larger controllers is also tied to a physical port, and virtual. Uh, these interfaces are typically going to be created during the controller setup. Now, if you go to my controller here and we go into interfaces, you can see that I don't actually have three different interfaces. I have a dynamic one, this is my virtual interface here, uh, This, sorry, virtual, and I have my management interface. I chose not to create, well, this particular model of uh, controller doesn't have a service port. So uh, the 5508 has a separate physical service port, so you'd see a service interface in that particular case. All right. Now the other type of interface that you can create is a dynamic interface. These are user-defined interfaces, and these are usually where you're going to define your VLANs for your wireless LAN access. Uh, like a sub-interface on a router, right, where you have a 802.1Q sub-interface or, or interface on a router, and you can set up sub-interfaces and, and specify VLAN information for each of the sub-interfaces. All right, so let me see what it says on the slide here. Uh, must assign each interface to a port. Uh, cannot assign multiple ports to an interface, uh, but you can assign multiple wireless LANs to an interface. Uh, the VLAN ID will be either represented as untagged, you guys saw that in my configuration, which is a value of zero, or any value specified would be tagged, uh, and you can assign multiple interfaces to a port. All right, yeah, we talked about all of that stuff, all right. What is the management interface? What is it used for? Well, management, right? The management interface controls all the communication with the network equipment. Uh, typically for physical ports in most environments. It can be untagged. That means you're going to set the tag value to zero. But Cisco does recommend tagging your traffic. Uh, that's kind of a best practice standard in most industry deployments today. Make sure you tag your traffic. All right. Um, one second here. 
All right, so the management interface has only one pingable address. You can access the, the GUI. Uh, that's what I've got set up on my configuration, right? Um, the Put in the management IP address. Mine's 192.168.0.253. Uh, we can also have that interface uh, connected to a AAA server. It can, like I said, can be tagged, it can be untagged, but it has to be reachable by the APs. Okay, that's very, very important. The management interface has to be reachable by the APs. Uh, and also the other controllers in the network, especially if you're doing mobility. The APs actually use the management interface to discover the controller. So that's a very, very important concept. Um, it also becomes the default AP manager interface, uh, and you should typically leave it that way. Remember, the AP manager interface is where the cap lap tunnel terminates and so on. Uh, for CapLap, the controller requires at least one management interface to control all of the intercontroller communication and to control the controller to access point communication. Doesn't matter how many physical ports you have on the device. All right. Uh, what else? Let me see. Oh, the management interface is also used for layer three communication between the controller and uh, the APs once they've joined. So all of that uh, routed information is going to happen there. Uh, and it becomes the, the IP address that you actually assign to the management interface uh, becomes the tunnel source for all the CapLab packets that go from the controller to the access point um, as the destination for those CapLab pack packets from the access point to the controller as well. So it's a very, very important um, interface. You don't have to overcomplicate the configuration. I've seen some implementations where uh, they've created you know, 30 or 40 different dynamic interfaces. Uh, it's not necessary. It's really not necessary. If you want to load share or you want to do some load balancing across multiple interfaces, really all you need to do is set up link aggregation uh, and just use the, the, the interfaces connected together. So uh, how does the link aggregation work? Yeah. It's uh, basically ether channel. It's part of that 802.3 AD port aggregation standard that we talked about before. What it does is it allows us to bundle all the controller's ports together to give us additional bandwidth, redundancy, failover features, and so on. If you have link aggregation enabled, the system dynamically manages the port redundancy. It's going to do all the load balancing for you. It's completely transparent. You don't have to do any configuration to manage that. Uh, in the 5760, uh, if you're running it as an iOS XE controller, it's not going to require that the controller distribution ports be bundled together. You can actually create multiple lags, uh, different lag groups, I should say. Uh, that's not the case with the uh, AeroS controllers, by the way. Uh, you can understand what the benefit is here, right? You don't have to configure primary and secondary ports for each interface. If a port fails, you still have connectivity and so on. You cannot configure the controller's ports into separate lag groups if it's an AeroS controller. Only one lag group is supported per controller. All right. If you enable lag, you can also configure only one AP manager interface because there's only one logical port needed. Right? And that's what I was saying before. There's not just there's no need to have a whole bunch of different interfaces, okay? All right. Uh, what else? Mm. Yeah, I guess that's about it, right? I mean, you guys understand the concept of bonding ports together and what the benefit of that is and what benefit that provides. Some uh, controllers, like the 55, the larger 5500, the 7500, the 8500, they actually have a separate out of band Ethernet port, gigabit Ethernet port, uh, as a service port. The service port interface is reserved strictly for out of band management of the controller. Uh, it also does, that's where you do all your recovery and maintenance and, and how you can access the controller if there's a network failure and, and whatnot. It's the only port that's actually active when the controller is in boot mode um, before it's actually booted up with its full configuration. 
Uh, you can't do tagging on this port, so it has to be connected to an access port on the switch as well. Also, this port is not auto sensing. Don't know why they did that. I've run into that situation before, uh, but you have to use the proper type of ethernet cable when you're connecting um, to, uh, to the service port. Okay, so just something, to, I run into that and it's been kind of a pain. It has to be in a different VLAN uh, than the management interface as well. That is absolutely a requirement. Okay, you can still use DHCP to assign an address to the port, uh, and you you know well you can still route that traffic, but it has to be in a different VLAN than your main uh, than your standard management port. Okay. Now you'll notice that when you when I went to my uh, controller here that I see this virtual interface, and when I click in it, there's not a whole lot that I can configure here. Right, get an IP address, put in a host name. I don't assign it to a port. There's nothing that I do here uh, to really configure this particular interface. So what the heck is this interface used for? Well, the virtual interface is used for mobility management to provide DHCP relay services. So if uh, um, I'm acting as uh, this interface acts as that placeholder for the clients that need to obtain their IP addresses from a DHCP server, uh, it's used for web authentication. So it's the redirect address for web authentication and it also maintains DNS gateway hostname information that's used by Layer 3 security and mobility managers to verify the source of our certificates when we're doing Layer 3 web authorization. All right, so there are many, many things that this virtual address is, is, uh, um, is used for, okay? The virtual address interface, the interface IP address doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be real, it doesn't have to be routable. Uh, it doesn't have to be assigned. Uh, it doesn't have to have a gateway. So you can use any address you want, okay? And it's only seen on the wireless side of the network. It disappears in the payload of the packets when you're communicating onto the infrastructure, all right? The, uh, I use 1.1.1.1. That's generally what Cisco recommends. That is a reserved address, by the way. Uh, the IANA has that reserved, uh, that address reserved, but whatever. It, you're not sending anything out over the internet. It's uh, local to the system, so that's typically what I'll use. If you have several controllers that are part of a mobility group, very, very important concept here. If you have several controllers that are part of a mobility group, and if you recall, mobility means we're, we're moving from one AP to another AP to another AP, and we're trying to maintain our connectivity status. But if you have uh, several controllers that are part of that group, you need to make sure that that virtual gateway interface is the same. That's what's gonna provide for seamless roaming uh, across those different um, <clears throat> across those different controllers, make sure that that address is the same. Dynamic interfaces, uh, which are basically our VLAN interfaces, these get created by you as the administrator, uh, and typically you'll create dynamic interfaces and associate those to VLANs. Right? Uh, depending on the the model or the platform, you can create hundreds of these dynamic interfaces. I think it's over 500 that you can create. Each dynamic interface is individually configured, separate communication streams, uh, the VLAN information, all the, the uh, configuration allows for communication between controllers, network devices, and so on. Each dynamic interface can also act as a DHCP relay for the clients that are actually associated to the wireless LANs that are mapped to that particular interface. So it's actually possible to assign dynamic interfaces to, to, um, to provide those relay services. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can show you what I mean here. So if I go in to create a new interface, let's just call it test for now, and I'm gonna put that in VLAN 20. All right, you'll notice that we have an option um, to, where is it at, uh, to specify DHCP. Um, and uh, this allows me, this, this is what allows me to perform that relay function, right? So when I create this, put an IP address on the interface, 
you, you have to have an IP address on the interface so that you can provide that relay service. Uh, and then we can um, specify how the proxying is going to occur. All right, you can apply security policies to the interface as well. What port number, physical port number it's connected to, uh, backup physical port number, um, and it'll tell you which port is active when you go into the interface and so on. Uh, and you can use it as an AP manager interface in this case. Now again, Cisco doesn't recommend usually typically using dynamic interfaces as your AP manager interface. You want a separate management interface for that. Okay. Uh, so let me go back to my interfaces and clean that out. Don't want that there. All right. Scroll right. Oops. Let me do that again. Remove. Yep. Notice I don't get the option to remove my virtual interface or my management interface. These are interfaces that existed by default. Okay. All right. Like I said, each dynamic interface is individually configured. That allows separate communication streams to exist and so on. Uh, dynamic interfaces have to be on different VLANs or different subnets from all the other interfaces that are configured on the particular port. If the port is untagged, all dynamic interfaces must be on a, a different IP subnet from any other interface that's configured on that particular port. Uh, we generally will tag all of these these dynamic interfaces. Okay? Pretty straightforward configuration. Uh, when you then build, uh, when you build your wireless LANs, then you can assign those wireless LANs to those respective interfaces. Usually we won't create a separate interface um, for each VLAN. Uh, that's one, another thing I want to point out. Well, actually, if you want to do the tagging for the traffic, you would have to do that. But then when you go into the wireless LAN, you assign that wireless LAN to the interface. The interface then gets assigned to the port. So that's the progression, right? Create the, uh, create the port or configure the port or lag if you're going to set up a lag. Uh, create the interface, set up the interface properties, go create the wireless LAN, tie that to the interface, which then is tied to the port. All right. Now, if you only have a couple of controllers in your network to manage, all you need is to go to the GUI uh, and individually manage those, um, those uh, devices. But at some point, you may have potentially 100 controllers, 20 controllers, 30 controllers, I don't know, however many. You may want to have a centralized method of managing those particular controllers. And Prime Infrastructure allows that to happen. All right. You have to have ROS 8.x and above if you want to use Prime Infrastructure. And you have to be using at least Prime Infrastructure 2.2 and above to be able to manage those uh, controllers. We can manually configure the controller. We can use templates uh, to propagate configuration uh, changes to the controller. Uh, we can push out those configuration changes to multiple controllers at the same time. Uh, this, uh, we have the ability to do the same thing with APs, radio templates, uh, all kinds of templates that are pre-built in prime infrastructure to allow us to manage that. Uh, we can do converged access configuration as well, but we're talking about in this particular case, the centralized uh, management piece. Okay, so that wraps up this lesson. We talked about obviously ROS and uh, iOS XE and how that can be used in a centralized deployment. We took a look at the wireless LAN controller CLI. Uh, talked a little bit about that and some of the things that you might have to configure. Um, the ROS initialization through the CLI, the GUI, we talked about WES and, and how we can use that um, either wired or wirelessly. Uh, the dashboard we took a very quick look at uh, and then we talked about prime infrastructure and, and uh, all the ports and the different interfaces dynamic versus static, management, virtual, and so on. Hopefully you guys now have an understanding of the difference between those, those different types of interfaces and so on. Okay, so in our next lesson, uh, we'll talk about how APs get initialized uh, and how we actually uh, establish our access point uh, setup in our configuration. But before we do that, we're going to go into the next lab exercise
and we're going to perform that lab and then we'll, we'll get on to this um, to the next lesson.